Good afternoon. My name is Renelle Miles, and I want to welcome you to the NIH Office of Disease Prevention Medicine Mind the Gap series. The seminar series explores issues at the intersection of research, evidence, and clinical practice, areas in which conventional wisdom may be contradicted by recent evidence. From the role of advocacy organizations in medical research and policy to the importance of behavioral interventions, the Office of Disease Prevention hopes to engage the prevention research community in thought-provoking discussions to challenge what we think we know and to think critically about our role in today's research environment. Before I begin, I have some housekeeping items. To participate by Twitter, follow us at, at NIHPrevents and submit questions using the hashtag NIHMTG. You may also email questions to prevention at mail.nih.gov. There is also a link to a feedback form at the bottom of the video cast page where you can submit questions during the talk. At the conclusion of today's talk, we will open the floor to questions that have been submitted via email and Twitter. Lastly, please visit the seminar page on the ODP website at prevention.nih.gov slash mindthegap following <coughs> today's talk and click the link to the seminar evaluation under the resource section to submit your, to submit your feedback about the seminar. At this time, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. David M. Murray, Associate Director for Prevention and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. Thank you, Renell. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. David McKinnon has been developing, evaluating, and applying methods to assess how interventions work for 30 years. He is a foundation professor in the Department of Psychology at Arizona State University. He received his undergraduate degree from Harvard University, a PhD in measurement and psychometrics from UCLA in 1986, and was an assistant professor at the University of Southern California's Institute for Prevention Research from 1986 to 1990 before moving to Arizona State. He has given numerous workshops in the United States and in Europe. In 2011, he received the Nan Tobler Award from the Society for Prevention Research uh, for uh, his book on statistical mediation analysis, which is the topic of his presentation today. Dr. McKinnon recently received the Merit Research and Time Award from the National Institute on Drug Abuse for his research on mediation analysis. He has served on federal grant review committees and is a former consulting editor for the journal Prevention Science and is on the editorial board for Psychological Methods. Dr. McKinnon has been the principal investigator on several NIH grants and is a Thomson Reuters highly cited researcher. He is a fellow in the Association for Psychological Science, the Society for Prevention Research, and the American Psychological Association Measurement and Statistics Division. At this time, I would like to welcome Dr. McKinnon and turn the session over to him at Arizona State University. Okay, great. Uh, can you hear me okay? Just fine, David. Okay, uh, thank you, David and Ronell, um, for the nice comments and also for inviting me to give this uh, webinar. Um, I'm calling in from Tempe, Arizona, where it uh, just rained, which is a very exciting event here. And uh, thank you for uh, coming to this webinar. Uh, and continuing with the thank yous, I'd like to thank uh, NIDA for their continued support um, to develop and evaluate uh, mediation methods. So I'm going to describe uh, mediating variable examples and applications. Uh, then I'm going to discuss statistical mediation analysis uh, and then uh, mention several advanced mediation models uh, that are especially relevant uh, for prevention research and then uh, briefly discuss them. Future directions, uh, there's a website there uh, that last I checked was working. Uh, and then this is a book I uh, finished in, or published in 2008 and now I'm actively working on the second edition of that book. <clears throat> so a mediator is a variable that's intermediate in a uh, causal process relating an independent variable to a dependent variable. Uh, here's some examples. An intervention has beneficial effects on exercise, which leads to reduced depression. Uh, the mediator is bold in these examples. Uh, tobacco prevention program promotes anti-tobacco norms, which reduce tobacco use. A uh, screening program increases identification of early stage cancer, which reduces cancer deaths. Uh, Wellbutrin decreases participants' willingness to quit and self-efficacy. So that would be two mediators there, willingness to quit and self-efficacy which are associated with one month abstinence from tobacco. And maybe you can think of a couple examples that you have right now. Here's a diagram to represent the single mediator model uh, where we have an independent variable X, a dependent variable or outcome variable Y. And then we have 
of mediator M. And we have a direct effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable Y represented by Q prime uh, and the A and A coefficient that represents the effect of X on M and a B coefficient that represents the effect of M on Y. So there's an effect of that independent variable X on Y both directly and then indirectly through the mediator. <clears throat> Here's some more mediator definitions. Mediator is a variable in a chain whereby an independent variable causes the mediator, which in turn causes the outcome. Uh, the generative mechanism in which the focal independent variable is able to influence the dependent variable. And then this last one is my favorite definition. It's from an epidemiology dictionary, uh, where a mediator is a variable that occurs in a causal pathway from an independent variable to a dependent variable. It causes variation in the dependent variable and itself is caused to vary by the independent variable. And this definition illustrates the challenge of mediation analysis that this mediating variable comes between two other variables and it's both a dependent variable in one equation and an independent variable in another equation. Uh, most of statistics focuses on two variable effects, like the correlation coefficient for the relation between X and Y, or a covariance or a regression coefficient, or an odds ratio. And with two variables, there's only so many relationships, right? We could have X causes Y, Y causes X, or they could be related for some other reason. With three variables, there are more different things that could happen. We, now we have X, M, and Y using M to represent the third variable. We could have X to Y to M, Y to X to M. So there are a lot of a lot more combinations of the ways that these variables, variables could be causally related. Um, and we have special names for these uh, relationships and third variables. One of them is confounder, another one is mediator, and another one is moderator interaction. So we have special names for these third variable effects. With four variables, there's lots of possible relations, right? We have X to Z to M to Y. We could have Y to M to Z to X. Lots of different combinations with four variables. <laughs> and with five variables, maybe there are so many combinations that it'd be best if just we went home and took a nap um, because there's just so many possible relations. Uh, but we don't take a nap, that even though lots of behaviors are caused by many different variables, we still need to investigate them. But we should keep in mind that there are these many possible relations among the variables in our model. A confounder uh, is a variable that's related to two variables of interest that obscures or accentuates the relation between them. Unlike a mediator, a confounder is not in the causal sequence. And that'll be the main characteristic of a mediating variable, that it's in a causal sequence from X to M to Y. A confounder is a variable that's related to X and Y, but it's not, it's not in that causal sequence. It causes both of them. So if you forget to include a confounder, um, you can get a wrong result. And then a moderator is a variable that affects the strength or relation between two variables, X and Y. Uh, again, a moderator is not intermediate in a causal sequence like a mediator. A moderator is just a variable where the relation between X and Y uh, differs at different values of that moderator. As you might expect, when looking at mediation, there can also be confounder variables and there can also be moderator variables, and we'll, we'll talk briefly about some of those issues. But these are other third variable effects, right? We have a mediator effect, a confounder effect, and a possible moderator effect of how a third variable could enter into the relationship between X and Y. <clears throat> so mediation is important because central questions in many fields are about mediating processes or how one variable affects another. It's important for basic research on mechanisms of effects. Uh, critical for applied research, especially prevention and treatment, to identify critical ingredients leading to more efficient interventions. And this is how I became interested in mediation analysis when I was first asked to look at how a tobacco, a school-based tobacco prevention program, achieved its effects. Um, and there's all kinds of entertaining statistical and mathematical issues. And I, I should add also that uh, there are many theoretical, substantive theoretical issues, and in fact, Mediating variables translate uh, theories in, in many different fields. Uh, this focus on mediating mechanisms uh, just seems to have grown over the last 20 years. And here's a quote from Tom Insel, the NIMH director, um, that future trials should follow an experimental medicine approach in which interventions serve not only to, as potential treatments, but as probes to generate information about the mechanisms underlying a disorder. It offers us a way to understand the mechanisms by which these treatments are leading to clinical change. 
and mediation is, analysis is a way to try to explore and investigate what the possible mechanisms are for treatment and also prevention programs. Uh, one of the most ubiquitous theories in psychology is the SOR theory, the stimulus organism response theory, where the effect of the stimulus on a response depends on mechanisms in the organism. Um, so the mediating mechanisms translate the stimulus to the response. We're able to measure the stimulus and we're able to measure the response, but we don't know what's going on inside the organism. That's where the mediating process occurs. So to illustrate this, for example, if I asked you to multiply 24 and 16, <clears throat> the stimulus is me asking you to multiply those two numbers. The response is your answer, which should be 384, and the mediator is you or what goes on inside your head. Um, it's midday there, it's pretty early here in Arizona, so maybe not so much is going on inside our heads here on the, on the West Coast. Um, and this is, follows this idea for SOR theory where uh, there's a black box and you have an input and an output to the black box. And I thought it might be interesting to show you a black box. Not sure what's going on in there. So here's this SOR model where we have a stimulus and a response. Both of those we can measure well. Uh, mental and other processes, we have to find some way to measure what's going on inside there. And we use questionnaires, uh, we could use EEG, we could use a variety of other approaches to try to understand what's going on inside uh, the organism. And the SOR model also illustrates the challenges of mediating variables, right? Because we have to come up with some reasonable way to measure the process. Um, and the process could be at a neuronal level, could be at a higher level, individual level, and so on. And we'd have to somehow uh, capture with our measurement uh, what's going on uh, in that mediating process. Mm -hmm. There are two overlapping applications of mediation analysis. One of them is mediation for explanation, which is a much an older, and then the other one is mediation by design. Mm -hmm. Mediation for explanation uh, comes out of some literature in around 1950s or so, where the idea was you had an observed relationship and then you try to explain it by adding a third variable. And in fact, they had different names for what we would call a covariate. So if you added a third variable and it didn't change the relation between X and Y, that was called a replication variable, or we would call a covariate now. Um, if it explained the relationship between two variables when you adjusted for a third variable, that was called an explanation variable. Now we call that a confounder. And if it was intervening in the relationship between X and Y, it was called an intervening variable, what we would now call a mediator. And what we now call a moderator, they would call a specification variable. Uh, essentially translating the idea is that the relation to next and Y is specific to values of the third variable. So that's mediation for explanation, uh, where an observed relation is obtained, and then statistical analyses are undertaken to try to understand how that third variable operates. A much more modern approach or application of mediation is what I call mediation by design where we'll select mediating variables that are causally related to an outcome variable, and then we'll design an intervention to change these mediators. In fact, all a researcher often knows at the beginning of this line of research is which variables are related to the outcome. And then we'll design an intervention based on the variables that are related to that outcome. And if the mediators are, in fact, causally related to the outcome, if we change that mediator with an intervention, we will change the outcome. This is a common model applied in applied research like prevention and treatment, and it seems to be uh, felt to be even more useful uh, as the years go by as a way to understand and also develop prevention and treatment programs. So here's a diagram of an intervention mediation model uh, where, again, we still have X and Y, where X is the intervention program, uh, mediators and outcomes, and we have uh, two kinds of theory in this mediation model. We have manipulation theory. Uh, and conceptual theory. Conceptual theory is the usual way we think about theory. Uh, that's what variables are related to the outcome. What are the risk factors that predict an outcome variable? Let's say it's smoking. Um, manipulation theory is uh, less commonly discussed. That's how we would design an intervention to affect the mediators. And this is pretty tricky, right? What are the intervention components that would work to manipulate, let's say, social norms or beliefs about alcohol use? or beliefs about screening. So are these two types of theory, manipulation theory and conceptual theory. <clears throat> and these mediators play a primary role. And identification of those, these mediators is important for basic and 
applied research, right? If we can design a study and find evidence that a mediator does seem to be the important one for an intervention, uh, we can make our interventions uh, more effective by picking the components for the mediators that are most important to target, and we can reduce the cost by removing, let's say, parts of interventions that um, do not necessarily change the mediators that we're interested in. Okay, so to summarize, we have these uh, three variables involved. I've talked about confounders and moderators, but now we're really going to only focus on mediators, although those other terms will come up. Um, and that there are two kinds of theory, one relating X to M and another theory relating M to Y. And conceptual theory is usually the way that most people think about theory is relating to M to Y. But then there's this other very important thing for interventions, right? And that's how uh, we'd go about actually changing a mediator. So, for example, impulsivity is found to be related to lots of different problem outcomes. Uh, but perhaps in our three-session school program, uh, we wouldn't be able to change impulsivity. We wouldn't have enough sessions to change it. So we might pick a different mediator, a more realistic mediator. And decisions about what can be changed and what can't be changed, given the limitations of our uh, intervention environment, uh, would be a manipulation theory discussion. Okay. So now we're going to move to how we'd actually estimate some of these um, coefficients. And the single mediator model uses uh, information from some or all of three regression equations. Uh, these coefficients in the equations may be obtained using ordinary least squares, covariance structure analysis for logistic regression. <clears throat> Although with logistic regression, for example, some of the rules I'll talk about don't directly apply. Um, we'll use a test called the product of coefficients test uh, that will be general to more complicated models, actually any model that we can come up with, we can come up with a product of coefficients test to evaluate the mediator. <laughs> so here's the first regression equation. Um, often the most important analysis in any experiment, that's whether there's a significant intervention effect on the outcome. And if we've randomized X, we've balanced all confounders, so this C coefficient will be an estimator of a causal effect. It turns out, however, though, that for mediation, it's not necessary that there be a significant relation between X and Y for, their, for mediation to exist. And I would argue when you don't get a significant effect of X on Y, then we, that's when you should most definitely test for mediation, and I'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> a second regression equation tests the manipulation theory, the effect of X on M, represented by the A path. And again, if X is randomized, that will balance all things that could explain the relationship between X and M. Um, so the A coefficient will be an estimator of a causal effect. But it's not true for this third regression equation, uh, where we have both X and M predicting Y. Neither B nor C prime can be considered a causal effect unless certain assumptions are made. Uh, the main problem is that even though with X we've randomized people to different conditions, uh, we haven't randomized them to the value of the mediator. The actual value of the mediator that our uh, participant has, uh, they select. That has, that's uh, defined by their own characteristics. For mediated effect measures, uh, there's a product of coefficients measure, which is just the product of the A coefficient times the B coefficient. Uh, there's another way to estimate the mediated effect using the difference in coefficients. And I think you could argue that the difference in coefficients may be a more intuitive way to understand the mediated effect because C is the relation, the total relation between X and Y, and C prime is the relation between X and Y adjusted for the mediator. So it makes sense that the difference between those coefficients would be, uh, represent the mediated effect. In ordinary least squares regression, A, B is identical to C minus C prime. Mm -hmm. Also in this analysis, we'll have a direct effect, C prime, uh, and a total effect, which would either be the relation of X on Y, which will equal the mediated effect plus the direct effect. Uh, we can find the standard error of that mediated effect, AB. Uh, for those of you familiar with the concepts, that would just equal the square root of A, the A coefficient squared times the standard error of B squared plus B squared times the standard error of A squared. Uh, this is derived uh, using the multivariate delta method. We could test for significant mediation by taking that mediated effect and dividing it by that standard error. Um, but there are more accurate tests. It turns out that A times B uh, doesn't have a normal distribution, so the Z test is not the best test. Uh, it has the distribution of the product. 
So if we use the distribution of the product to do these significance testing, we can get more accurate confidence intervals, uh, more accurate type 1 error rates, and more power. Uh, there are some serious some assumptions of these methods, right? For each method of estimating the mediate effect based on equations one and three or two and three, um, that's right, we'd only need equations one and three to look at the C minus C, C prime estimator or equations two and three to look at AB. We assume we have reliable and valid measures. We assume the coefficients A, B, and C prime reflect true causal relations in the correct functional form. And by correct functional form, I mean that there's a linear, typically it's a linear relationship between variables. We also assume that there aren't any omitted influences, uh, important things that say predict M and Y that we have not included in, in the statistical analysis. We also assume the mediation chain is correct, that the temporal ordering is correct, that X comes before M and M before Y. We also assume that effects are consistent across subgroups, that there aren't any subgroups in our data where the relationship next to M and M to Y differs. Um, essentially, it assumes that we don't have any moderators. I used to have three pages of assumptions, but it was too depressing, so I stick with that one page there. Um, significance testing and confidence limit estimation we could go on and on for a while on this topic. Uh, the bottom line is that method based on the product AB applies in longitudinal models, in multi-level models, all kinds of uh, different advanced models. Uh, it can be more cumbersome to uh, use that C minus C prime approach uh, in more complicated models. Uh, the best tests are a test called the joint significance test, which is just testing whether the A path is significant and testing whether the B path is significant. If both of them are significant, you would conclude there's a, a significant mediated effect. Um, there aren't any confidence limits that you could obtain with that. Uh, more accurate or the best methods are a method based on the distribution of the product, which uh, uses uh, the, the distribution of the product to come up with uh, critical values rather than using Z values, and also the bootstrap which is a resampling method, uh, and both the distribution of the product and the bootstrap do the same thing. They handle the fact that the product AB does not have a normal distribution. Here's a table that we made a while ago uh, in a paper in 2007 that looked at comparison of these different methods uh, in their power to detect the mediated effect. So these numbers here are sample size estimates. The sample size you would need to have 0.8 power to detect the mediated effect. The, at the top, the SS refers to a small effect for the A path, a small effect for the B path, and small, medium, and large are defined as in Cohen, roughly a small effect is a correlation of 0.1, medium correlation of 0.3, and large correlation of 0.5. So for LL, there would be a large effect for A and a large effect for B, and those numbers all look reasonable. But the most surprising thing in this table is uh, there's a method that would require a series of steps. First would require that X is significantly related to Y, uh, X is significantly related to M, and M is significantly related to Y. Um, that has enormous sample size requirements, 20, 20, around 21,000. When we first saw this, we were shocked, uh, but then we uh, did some more work and that number is correct. If you think about it, and this is a case where there's no direct effect, the, a small A path and a small B path when multiplied are a very small effect. And if you require that X is significantly related to Y uh, and the effect is that small, you need a very, very large sample size to detect it. Um, the better off using the distribution of the product below, but even a distribution of the product, if the A path is small and the B path is small, um, the sample size is substantial <coughs> and that sample size is comparable to if we use the bootstrap, for example. Um, of course, this table is cross-sectional. It doesn't include any covariates or it doesn't include longitudinal data, other methods that could increase uh, power to detect an effect. But the bottom line is methods that require a significant effect of X on Y when looking at mediation uh, will be underpowered. And this is related to this topic. Um, it's important to look at mediation if, even when the effect of X on Y is not significant. Um, it's easy to show that there are many cases where the effect of uh, X on Y has less power than the test of mediation. And there's a few papers out now that demonstrate that and when that occurs. Uh, but I think the most reason, most important reason for looking at mediation when there's a non-significant effect of X on Y uh, 
is you can provide get information about manipulation theory, uh, whether your manipulation was unable to change the mediator, uh, and information on conceptual theory, uh, whether M was related to Y. Both of those are important, and failure of one or both of them could explain a non-significant effect of X on Y, and maybe uh, would help uh, decide if you wanted to make a uh, change to your intervention. Um, Okay, now I'm going to go through some more advanced models and really just kind of uh, go through them quickly. But we could expand the uh, single mediator model to have multiple mediators. Here there are four mediators. But notice now I've got to have some notation to keep track of which path is which. So I have A1 for the X to M1 path, B1 for the M1 to Y path, and so on. So here's a four mediator model. Um, with that model, there are now four mediated effects. There's a1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3, and A4, B4. We could get the standard error for each of those. We'll have a total mediated effect, which is the sum of all the mediated effects. We can have the direct effect and the total effect, which would be the sum of all the mediated effects plus the direct effect. Uh, we could test significance for mediation, but again, if we use a method based on the distribution of the product or bootstrapping, we'll get more accurate uh, confidence intervals and statistical tests. Um, Another important issue is this notion of an inconsistent mediation model. This is a mediation model that has at least one mediated effect with a different sign than the direct effect or other mediated effect. Um, there is mediation, it's just that the sign um, of these coefficients is different for some of the mediated effects and some of the direct effects. Uh, I think this is important because intervention studies may have a mediator that is counterproductive. And really the only way to find it is with these multiple mediator models. For example, in a study uh, where Lynn Goldberg was the principal investigator, an intervention study for high school football players, and part of this intervention uh, taught them the reasons to use anabolic steroids, right? You, use you, want the student, you want to be credible to the students who need to show both sides. And as you can see here, the program increased their knowledge of reasons to use steroids, which then actually increased their intentions to use steroids. That was a counterproductive mediation effect. Fortunately, all of the other program components uh, outweighed the, uh, this counterproductive component, um, and so the effect was overall a reduction in intentions to use steroids, but we did have this um, counterproductive uh, mediated effect. And this would be an inconsistent mediation model because the mediated effect is the product of 0.573 times 0.073, uh, and the direct effect is negative 0.181. So even though overall we had a significant reduction in intentions, we had this uh, a counterproductive mediating process. And I would expect that there may be many of these in our interventions, and really the only way to find them is to look at these types of mediation analysis. Um, this idea of inconsistent mediation is not uncommon. For example, as people get older, typically uh, there are situations where there's no change in the effect on an outcome. So here, for example, typing proficiency. As people get older, there may be a close to zero effect of age on typing proficiency. Uh, because there are these opposing mediated effects. There's an immediated effect on age. As people get older, uh, your reaction time gets slower and your typing proficiency goes down. But then also, as you get older, you get more skills, uh, and that increases your typing proficiency. So perhaps overall, there's no change in typing profici proficiency because there are these uh, theoretical uh, and, and actual uh, uh, counterproductive or opposing mediated effects. Um, there's a theory for this called compensation theory and aging, right, that as people get older, as they lose capacity, they find other methods to make up for that. Um, here's an example of moderation and mediation. Here we have a mediated effect in group one. I've got three boxes there. And a mediated effect in group two. This could be, let's say, an intervention for males and females. Um, and we could do comparisons, uh, compare the action theory or the A path across the groups or the conceptual theory by comparing the B path. And we could even test the mediated effect across groups. So this would be a way to include individual differences in a mediation analysis. There are also longitudinal mediation models. Um, mediation is a longitudinal model. Um, we assume we've got the correct ordering that X is before M and M is before Y, even when we have cross-sectional data. And with cross-sectional data, we have to make an assumption that X, M, and Y are at some equilibrium so that the observed relations are real and not solely due to when they were measured. For example, if we measured things an hour later, we'd get a different model. <clears throat> um, part of longitudinal mediation analysis requires the correct timing and spacing of measures. Uh, it requires answering the question, when does X affect M and M affect Y? 
Um, these are theoretical questions that should be addressed before a study. Uh, there's lots of different potential processes for how it might occur. There could be triggering or cascading of the X to M or M to Y relation. Uh, the process by which X affects M and M affects Y uh, could differ. So we could have a triggering relation between X and M, and then maybe some linear relationship and change of M on Y. So timing is crucial both theoretically for when an effect occurs, but then also uh, when we collect the longitudinal data, uh, we need to try to design a longitudinal study to capture uh, when these things tend to occur. Uh, with two measures of X, M, and Y, uh, there are a few options. There's a, we could compute a different score, and in COVA, we could compute residualized change. <clears throat> if we have X, M, and Y at three or more time points, there's a lot of different models, um, autoregressive, latent growth curve, latent change, survival model. For intervention research, typically X is measured once, but then sometimes uh, X is uh, measured other times, or there are buff or, uh, additional interventions that are given. But typically, X is measured uh, after baseline, or after the intervention, X represents intervention, uh, and it's uh, measured once or delivered once, although there are some. Uh, intervention studies that have boosters, so then I guess X would be repeated. But typically, with intervention studies, X is measured once. Here's an example of an autoregressive model with time-ordered mediation, um, where now we have X1, the mediator is now M1, M2, and M3. The outcome is Y1, Y2, Y3. So this is an example where we have an inter one intervention X, and then we have an A1 path that relates X1 to M2, where X is before M2. And then M2 is related to Y3. So M2 uh, is, comes before Y3. This would be called a longitudinal mediated effect because the timing is correct. It's time one X to time two mediator to time three outcome variable. The mediated effect would then be the product of A1 times B1. And we could use any of those statistical methods to test the significance of that uh, A1, B1. As you can imagine, you could add more waves of data um, which would make for more mediated effects. If X was repeated, you'd have mediated effects that would occur at other times and so on. The S in this model, by the way, just refers to the stability of M1 and uh, Y and Y over time. Okay, one of the most active areas in, in mediation analysis right now is causal inference. <clears throat> The methods above assumed we had the true causal relations and we had, there weren't any omitted variables. In a 1979 presidential address, Blaylock uh, suggested that for sociological phenomenon, there are about 80, uh, 50 variables are involved. That's a lot of variables. Uh, there are also these comprehensive health psychology models that would consider all the variables that are related to a health behavior. For example, um, all the variables that would be related to flossing, for example. And you might want to think for a minute how many variables are related uh, are important for your research project that would have a non-zero relation of the, of the outcome variable. That's a lot of variables, too many variables. Remember earlier we talked about all the possible relations, even with just five variables, to think about all the possible ones, the 50. The other issue with mediation analysis that I mentioned earlier is that because even though we randomly assign people to levels of X, we don't randomly assign them to a value of M because M is typically self-selected in that context. <clears throat> Most of these modern causal inference models are counterfactual or potential outcome models. Um, models consider, for example, a treatment participant if instead they were in the control group or a control participant if instead they were in the treatment group. So for each person, you think about the possible or potential conditions that they could be in. And in that situation, all these possible counterfactual and actual conditions of an experiment are considered, and the statistical model is based on all of these potential outcomes. Uh, in a two-group design, uh, it, for these causal inference approaches, we'd like to have the same person in both groups at the same time, which can't happen. And that's called the fundamental problem of causal inference, uh, because we'd like to have the same person simultaneously serve in both the treatment and the control condition. However, if we randomize a large number of persons, we can take the average in each group, and as long as the uh, randomization 
worked as it supposedly worked, uh, then the difference in the means between those two groups is a causal effect. And this is why the A path and the C path earlier are causal effects with randomization, because by randomizing, we balanced all the possible confounders uh, so we can interpret those coefficients as a causal effect. But B and C prime don't have a causal relation because M is not under experimental control. B and C do not necessarily represent causal effects. What we really need is we'd need the relation between M and Y for participants in the treatment group if they were in the control group. We need the relation between M and Y for control participants if they instead were in the treatment group. So coefficients B and C prime are not causal effects because M is not randomized. So what can you do about that? And this is a, a diagram that represents this issue where uh, we have the usual mediation model that we have already talked about, but now we have these red boxes. Um, when I see this, I always think about the TV shows that have the angel and the devil on one on each shoulder. Uh, this is really two devils on each shoulder. Um, where we have possible confounders of the X to M relationship, and we have possible confounders of the M to Y relationship. If we randomize X, uh, then the confounder of the X to M relation will go away because we balanced all those confounders between groups. But this confounder of the M to Y relationship could still be present. And in fact, if, we, if the model really looked like this, we would need to have those D coefficients as well as A, B, and C prime to correctly uh, investigate the mediated effect. <clears throat> There's a couple options uh, that can be done in this situation, right? Because often we don't know, we haven't measured these confounders. Um, we can do a kind of sensitivity analysis. The, the idea is to see how much the mediation effect would change for a possible confounder of a certain size. One of these methods we've adapted from a, the love method by Morrow which uh, has, is easier to describe, uh, where you'd come up with what the mediated effect would be if you had a confounder that had a certain correlation with Y and a, and a confounder that had a certain correlation with M. And again, this is a confounder that you haven't measured. So then you can see as you vary those correlations of this unobserved confounder with Y and M, how the mediated effect changes. Vanderweel has another method that can be applied uh, for any statistical method uh, that looks at similarly the relationship of confounder and the outcome, but then also the proportion of people in each group who have that confounder variable. And again, you, these are you'd have to guess at those possible values because it's an unobserved confounder, and the idea would be to see how effects change as you vary this. And then MI has a method based on the correlation between error terms that also would reflect confounding. Uh, another method to deal with this type of confounding uh, would be a, would be statistical methods, um, and each one of these uh, has a long history. Um, and again, they're a way to deal with omitted variable bias. One method is incidental variable methods, um, which would be relevant in intervention trials if you could uh, find an intervention that or a mediator that was a complete mediator, that there was no direct effect of X on Y once you adjust for the mediator. Uh, methods based on uh, stratifying or theoretical stratifications of how people would be likely to be affected by the intervention, a principal stratification method, a method called inverse probability weighting, which I'll briefly describe on the next page. And then finally, a method called G-estimation. Uh, work on these methods is, is active, and uh, there's developments uh, every month or so of different approaches uh, to improve causal inference based on these uh, statistical methods. And I'd like to just briefly talk about inverse probability weighting. It's a method to adjust confounders, but it's a method to adjust for uh, the confounders that you've measured. It has to assume that there's no unmeasured confounding. Uh, but you could use all your measures at baseline, for example, uh, as a way to deal with uh, possible confounders. Uh, it conducts a weighting type method uh, that uh, could also be used with missing data and so on. But the idea of these weights are used to adjust each individual's uh, contribution to the analysis depending on how much there's confounding of their M to Y relationship. Again, that's a, a useful, relatively straightforward way uh, to adjust for uh, confounding in your analysis. And often people have lots of baseline measures, uh, so they could be included uh, in the statistical analysis. <clears throat> there are also design approaches to improving causal inference. 
So one way to view mediation analysis is that, let's say you have a measure of X and you have a measure of Y, and you also have a measure of the mediator. What's the best way to use that measure of the mediator? I think most people would agree if, if you have a measure of X, M, and Y, you have more information than if you just have X and Y. So mediation analysis really is the what's the optimal way to use that measure of the mediating variable to try to understand this uh, mediating process. But another question would be, after you've completed one study, what's the next best study that you could do to uh, validate or gain more information about a particular mediating variable? And there are two general types of designs you could use. One of them would be consistency, where you demonstrate that the mediated effect uh, is consistent in other groups with similar variables, with similar measures of the mediator, for example. Another approach would be a specificity type study where you would demonstrate that the mediated effect is specific to one mediator, let's say, and not specific to another mediator. Um, so there's, there's two, two design approaches to improve uh, inference about a mediating process. <clears throat> and then here are some future directions, um, things that are going now, uh, mediation meta-analysis or approaches where you could use information from prior studies uh, that looked at mediation, including studies maybe that just looked at the A path or just looked at the B path, as a way to combine that information in the most reasonable way uh, possible. There are person-oriented methods that will investigate things like uh, how, are there people who seem to follow this mediation process and are there people who don't follow this mediating process? Uh, qualitative mediation methods, other ways to provide useful information about how media, uh, mediating variable process operate in a research study, for example, by interviewing participants in the study and so on, write a narrative about the, uh, how the stories uh, suggest of how this mediating process works. A uh, lot more work now in mediation for nonlinear models, especially logistic regression and survival analysis, and the potential outcomes model really has provided some groundbreaking ways to look at these types of, uh, look at mediation in these types of nonlinear models. And then finally, Bayesian mediation analysis uh, would be a way to include prior information in, in a mediation analysis. Um, one way, one interesting thing would be to link the Bayesian approach with uh, meta-analysis and synthesis, right, where you would use uh, information on all prior studies um, in your analysis of the current study. Okay, so to wrap it up, uh, mediation is important because it provides information on how variables are related, how an intervention achieves its effects, how effects over, unfold over time. In particular, mediation analysis can provide information on the manipulation theory, that is how your intervention changed M, and then also conceptual theory on which variables are, are causally related to the outcome. Of course, it's kind of interesting that uh, most researchers design an intervention where the only thing they really know is the B path. But then the B path is the one that's uh, affected by, or could be affected by confounders. Um, tests of mediation based on the product AB uh, with distribution of the product of bootstrap are the most accurate. Uh, you can have multiple mediator models. You can have models with moderation and mediation, uh, longitudinal mediation models. I didn't talk about it here, but there's multi-level mediation models and so on uh, that, again, apply these to just product methods to investigate mediated effects. And then causal inference is an active area of research, generating new methods to investigate confounder bias, and there are also experimental designs available. So here is the hypothesized effects of this presentation. We have the presentation. I hoped that I would increase uh, your uh, belief of the importance of mediating variables, increase knowledge of modeling methods for testing mediation, increase knowledge of longitudinal models and designs, and that, of course, that you think mediating variables are fun with the idea being maybe they'll we'll identify more of these mediating mechanisms in future research. Thank you. Thank you, David, very much. Um, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, lots of material in, uh, in 40 minutes. Um, we've got questions. Um, I have some. Um, we're we're get pulling in questions uh, via Twitter and email. So let's get started with those in the time that we have left. Um, uh, one observation of mine, most of the uh, uh, circumstances that you described in uh, uh, the material as you were presenting it assumed that you had a randomized experiment and that um, 
uh, individuals are randomized to study conditions and then you're looking at mediation in that context. Uh, what about quasi-experiments? What if, what if randomization isn't there uh, and people are assigned through some non-random process to uh, receive the intervention or not? Is mediation as useful? Uh, do, you, do, you take, do you change the approach? Does it work the same way? How, can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And I just focused on interventions um, because that seems to be the, uh, what would be uh, most relevant here. Right. Mediation is still important there. All the analysis methods still apply. Uh, but then the, the challenge for the X to M relationship is because of that quasi-experimental assignment, would, there could be confounders of the X to M relationship. But all, all these methods would apply there, uh, but the challenge would be greater uh, in that situation. Um, you, you mentioned that um, uh, mediation is important even if the intervention effect, the main effect that the investigator is going to be focused on, is not significant. So I'm imagining a situation where you've, you've done the analysis, the intervention did not have a significant effect on the outcome, but you've got a significant mediation effect. What would be the next step for the investigator? What, what, does, what does it mean in terms of the next thing to do? Right. Well, well, first of all, that can occur. Uh, there, uh, in some situations, you have much more power to detect the mediated effect than the outcome effect. One way to think about it is with mediation, you're more precisely uh, explaining the unexplained variability in M and Y. So that would be why maybe the overall effect of X on Y. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's not the best outcome in that situation, but it does suggest that the mediating process was was correct, the theoretical mediating process, and maybe uh, there could be, especially in that situation, these counterproductive uh, mediated effects that may have uh, you know, worked against the overall effect of X on Y. And the way to try to understand those would be to look at the multiple mediator model. Um, if you do that and you find some uh, counterproductive effects and some productive effects, you could modify your intervention to try to uh, address both, strengthening one, weakening others, and, and, uh, and uh, try it again. Exactly. And in that, uh, the example I talked about for the steroid prevention uh, program for uh, high school football players, we had a lot of discussion, as you might expect. Uh, and the decision was made that we really did need to describe the benefits of anabolic steroid use to increase credibility for, um, you know, for these adolescent kids to, to uh, to make it more believable, more credible. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, and I, I, I think there probably are more of these, those types of effects in our interventions uh, than we realize. And if we could study them more and extract that information about them, I, I think would have better interventions. All right. Uh, an, another kind of design that you uh, mentioned uh, a couple of times but not, didn't speak to directly would be a, a group or cluster randomized trial. And are there, are there mediation methods that are available for use with that kind of uh, design, a multi-level design? Yeah, there are just great ones. And as, as you know more than anyone, that pretty much every prevention study has a multi-level, right? That there are often uh, units are assigned at a higher level, like schools or clinics. Right, and there's some really fascinating aspects of mediation in the multi-level model. Uh, of course, there's two ways to view the, the multi-level part. First, there's a nuisance, right? A statistical thing that you have to deal with, and the other one has a as a the theoretically important effect. Um, so you could look at mediated effect, let's say at the school level, and then also at an individual level. There's a lot more information that can be gained from uh, from the study if you have that multi-level uh, structure to it. So but there the, are challenges in the analysis that you know well. Yeah. yeah, the the analysis is more complicated. It sounds like the mediation analysis is also more complicated, but but equally applicable and important. Right. Yeah, one of the most interesting models now are these models that would have uh, repeated measures of, uh, like for ecologically momentary assessment data that would have multiple measures of X, M, and Y for each person. So you could look at mediated effects within a person and then at the overall average mediated effect as well across people. That's an interesting uh, uh, examples of that now in the last probably five years or so. Um, our next question is, what are your thoughts about Hayes' methods of conditional process analysis and that full right. partial mediation is no longer meaningful or needed? Were you able uh, to hear that, David? Yeah, yeah, I heard it. Yeah, the, uh, well, the, I showed you one slide of a conditional 
mediation model, right, that had the, the two groups where the mediated effect could be uh, at one, uh, let one group but not another, or the APATH could differ. Um, yeah, the, uh, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not sure I understood the question about partial mediation, but uh, the, it, it would be ideal if, if it was, there was complete mediation, but I don't think that ever in, the, in our, with real research studies often, there'll be a direct effect. That we, it's very difficult to explain all of the effect of X on Y. Okay, is there any software for um, the causal inference methods that you mentioned? Right. There's a, uh, uh, there's SAS and SPSS programs uh, written by Linda Valeri and Tyler Vanderweel. Uh, the M plus program uh, written by uh, Linda and Bank Muten has uh, all of the causal estimators. They've really only been developed for the single mediator model though. Uh, there's some uh, recent work on different approaches with multiple mediators. Um, and I, I hope that there'll be more, uh, more software available for that over the next few years. I mean, the, the problem with multiple mediators is, remember, we talked about all the potential outcomes. So if you add another mediator, there's all those potential outcomes of a person could have a value of, on mediator one and a different value of mediator two. So it gets very large, all the possible, the potential outcomes gets very, very large. Uh, you described a number of assumptions uh, that underlie these uh, methods that you, that you uh, have presented today. In fact, you said you used to have a much longer list of assumptions, and, and it was frightening, so you've, you've, you <laughs> only present some of them now. Um, uh, uh, a lot of people are uncomfortable making too many assumptions and would like to at least test some of them, or, or at least the most important ones. Are there uh, methods available to evaluate some of those assumptions, to, to assure yourself that you're, you're not going too far astray? Right. Uh, good point. The, uh, yeah, there are ways to deal with each of those assumptions. Um, and there's, uh, there's some identification assumptions, which is a slide I took out, uh, that mainly uh, uh, relate to the confounders. Are there confounders of X on M? Are there confounders of X on Y? Are there confounders of M to Y? And are there any um, in effects of an intervention that then confound the M to Y relation? So there are actually only for identification assumptions. Um, but then there are these more inferential assumptions which I listed there. But for example, with, uh, for more reliable measures, we could use latent variable methods or do the measurement work to get more accurate measures. Uh, we can test for moderation um, and we can look at uh, the omitted variables by looking at the sensitivity to confounders and so on. Um, and I think the, the, like everyone says, I guess, is that looking at mediating variables is a cumulative process that requires lots of experiments. Of course, that's difficult in prevention often because we, mass, we have these large studies that are difficult to repeat. So we really need to get the maximum amount of information from each one of our studies. And, um, but then hopefully aspects of that could be replicated. Uh, do you recommend uh, doing sensitivity analysis around uh, the mediation models to, as a way of getting a sense of how far off you'd have to be with some of the assumptions to have a, a serious uh, change in the interpretation? Exactly, yeah. Sensitivity analysis for each of these assumptions is, uh, is uh, right is the way to go. Um, I mean, it's not like uh, mediated effects are real easy to find in intervention. I mean, it's in my experience, and they've been fairly consistent. For example, in school-based drug prevention, norms, especially norms among friends, seems to be the critical ingredient. For parenting, it seems like consistent discipline and parental warmth are, are critical. That things that just these are mediators that come up in lots of different studies. And then for uh, like uh, tobacco and alcohol treatment, uh, craving as an important mediator to target. So you'd hope that even though maybe each study has some flaws, that there'd be some consistency in that in the next study, if you decided to design the intervention based on targeting craving, that you'd get the effect that you'd, you know, you'd get the beneficial effects you'd expect. Um, how can people learn more about mediation? They've gotten this good introduction from you today. Uh, they're, they're interested in uh, learning more. Obviously, they could take a look at the, the book that you've written, and it sounds like you may be preparing a, a new edition. Uh, are there uh, courses that are available, workshops that are offered around the country? How can people learn more about this? 
Yeah, there are workshops offered. Uh, there's a great new book by Tyler Vanderweel on potential causal inference and mediation. Uh, 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 the um, well, let's see. There's uh, right workshops. Um, I've given some, um, and I think there's more and more. Uh, Andrew Hayes gives uh, workshops on moderation and mediation. Um, I guess that would be the way to do it. That, and then uh, there are some workshops uh, given. For example, I think each year I've given about two of them, uh, and then other people give them as well. Um, are there yeah, no, that's a good question. With all this stuff, we're making lots of stuff available online also. Okay. And if, I, I think that the amount of information is really growing. Lots more websites are including uh, program scripts, for example, uh, in M-plus and staff and so on. If people came to your website, they could uh, find information about where workshops are being offered and... Yes. I'll put that on there. Um, I have a question about mediation as it relates to um, variables that are obtained in machine learning algorithms. Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, or you need more information? <laughs> yeah, I need a little bit more information, but the, no matter where the data are obtained from, uh, they, th these would be the models that you'd try to address. And, it could be like an enormous amount of data, which I would think should improve the measurement of, of the variables and lead to more accurate results. Um, some of the causal inference methods are called machine learning methods. Any uh, uh, closing uh, remarks that you'd like to offer, David? Any advice to uh, uh, our well, audience? Well, thanks for uh, listening, and I thank you for the invite. I guess uh, when I started this 30 years ago, it was very difficult to get people interested in mediation, um, and now it's, it's great to see uh, uh, that people kind of realize how much there's information that's in our data that we can extract, and perhaps you know, our methods aren't perfect, uh, but we'll make the most out of uh, this information. And in fact, the information can be very, very useful for uh, both developing uh, programs and then, of course, evaluating. Well, I, I remember a conversation you and I had many years ago when you were thinking about writing a book about this. And I'm, I'm glad you did, uh, and the field is glad you did. And uh, uh, we want to thank you very much for your presentation today. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, if you have any more questions for our audience, please feel free to email Dr. McKinnon if you have specific questions that you want answered that we didn't get to today. Um, so thank you for all of the useful information that you shared and for everyone who participated today. On the Medicine Mind the Gap website, which is again prevention.nih.gov slash mindthegap, you will find several resources for this talk, including the slides, references, and a link to complete an evaluation. Your feedback is very important to us as we plan the remaining sessions for 2016. Our next Mind the Gap that was scheduled for April 26 with Phil Bourne has been postponed there will be more information posted on our website at a later date. Thank you again for um, your time. Thank you. Okay, thank you.